to this day, uh, in one way, you you know that he had magnetic personality. It was almost like a cult figure to a certain extent. Is that to this day, right, six years after his death, he's still, still getting the loyalty. People still love him. The people who work for him still love the man. My guest today is Gary Weiss. Gary has been uncovering Wall Street wrongdoings for nearly two decades. He's written for Barron's, Business Week, as well as Condé Nast Portfolio. His latest book is Retail Gangster, the insane real-life story of Crazy Eddie. Before Enron, before Madoff, before the Wolf of Wall Street, there was Eddie Antoff. Antoff was a marketing genius. He turned a tiny Brooklyn store into the largest retailer of consumer electronics in the Northeast under the name of Crazy Eddie. The company had one of the most iconic ad campaigns in history, Crazy Eddie, his prices are insane. Yet few knew that from day one, Crazy Eddie was built on fraud. The company went public in 1984, and once the extent of the fraud was revealed, it turned out to be one of the largest SEC frauds in American history. In fact, the Crazy Eddie fraud scheme is now taught in every business school across the United States. I recently sat down with Gary, and we talked about how Anton was able to defraud so many people for such a long period of time and why the fraud is studied today in business schools. Gary, thanks so much for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it, and I've been looking forward to it ever since I read your book. And folks, the name of the book is Retail Gangster, the insane real-life story of Crazy Eddie. And what you're going to teach us here, Gary, this on the man on the cover is not Crazy Eddie. In fact, there's only a few pictures of Crazy Eddie out there, and they're usually criminal ones. This was the uh, 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 actor, interviewer, radio personality, Jerry Carroll. Jerry Carroll. Right. All right. So first okay. off. Uh, Thanks for having me. Well, Appreciate it. My, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, the, the, especially if you lived in New York in the 80s, you could not, there's no way you could not know of the Crazy Eddie consumer retail electronic chain. Impossible. Uh they were masters in terms of advertising, and I think you put somewhere in the book here that their brand was more well-known than something. I think it was pretty, uh, than who was president or something, some crazy stuff. Right, yeah, not all right. Yeah, but you put something in there that most people knew Crazy Eddie than they knew something else. I forgot what you uh, put in here, but it was some pretty amazing stat. So what made you write this book? Well, I'd always been interested in Crazy Eddie. You know, it was sort of an interesting sort of background project that I'd always been thinking about doing. Um, I actually got to know Sammy Antar, who was the whistleblower, uh, about 15 years ago. We got to know, I got to know him. It's described in the book. And, you know, even though I, I, I had never actually been in a Crazy Eddie store, you know, it was a major cultural influence, and, and it and it combined two two things that you don't see that often. It was a, it was a major fraud, and at the same time, it was kind of a major asset to New York City, uh, a major cultural influence. Uh, and you don't see that very often. No one could say that about Enron or Madoff that he had any positive qualities. Um, but yeah, Crazy Eddie is, is remembered to this day in, 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 a, in, a, in a favorable way by generations of New Yorkers and the people throughout the Northeast in America. Right. So let's take a step back. Who was Crazy? What was Crazy Eddie? Uh, who was this guy, Eddie Anta, who started it? And uh, what, what was this phenomena, this retelling phenomena that he created with marketing glitz that turned out to be one of the largest security frauds I think in the SEC history. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie Eddie Antar was just a was just a kid from Brooklyn. He was a high school dropout. He was um very, very bright, but not very well educated. You know, he had dropped out of the high school at 14. And I think he's a proof of the adage that, you know, you don't necessarily need a lot of schooling to become a success. Because well, he became a success. Not through necessarily through legit the most legitimate means, but he certainly did. He got his uh, early training uh, on Times Square, working in in places that ripped off tourists. You know, they're still there, you know, just as much as they were back then. Very profitable business. You know, you overcharge people for cameras and binoculars and so on. That's how Eddie learned his business. He was set up in the electronics business by his father. Uh, 
on uh, Kings Highway, which is in a middle, uh, lower middle class neighborhood. And he was said, look, you know, you got to start, you know, start earning your living. You know, you're 21, you're getting married. Now you got to, you know, got to stand on your own two feet. And Eddie uh, came up with some really brilliant ideas in terms of how to make money in electronics at a time when it was hard for a little guy to make money in electronics. He, he figured it out. Yeah, what most people don't remember is that electronic stores, electronic companies, Sony and Panasonic, they made mm -hmm. retailers sell their uh stereo equipment and electronic equipment at MSRP, manufacturer's suggested yeah. retail price. So you couldn't break price or else they wouldn't sell you. Is that right? Right. Right. Yeah. They they, they were at war, uh, as I described in the book, uh, the manufacturers, not just of electronic goods, but of all kinds of goods, uh, were at war with discounters uh, since the 1940s. It was this massive war and the uh, manufacturers won. Uh, they got something called fair trade. It's really ironic that they called it yeah. fair trade. It wasn't fair, you know, not from the consumer standpoint, certainly. But fair trade, you know, allowed manufacturers to set the price of goods down the, down the supply chain. It, it was ridiculous. And Eddie, he figured out ways around that. Okay, so Eddie is how old? 22, 23, somewhere around there? Yeah, when early 20s. Early, early 20s, 20s, he takes over yeah. a store, which was called Sights and Sounds, if I recall, on King's Highway. Right. Uh, I pass that often. I'm, I still live in the neighborhood. And mm -hmm. uh, I do remember the Crazy Eddie stores. And uh, the, on the cover of the book, you have the uh, big Crazy Eddie store. This was on um, this was on Coney Island Avenue. This was the That's right. store on Coney Island That's Avenue. That's right. Second store. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so he opens up a electronic store that sells back in the day was records records was a big part of it right mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. records right. uh all sorts of electronic uh stereo equipment and what happens mm -hmm. what's so unique about what he does well he figured out a way of of uh pitching to people outside of his neighborhood he wasn't going to make any money uh, selling to people in brooklyn you know in the immediate area he had a he had a sell to people in manhattan so he figured out a way he he had figured out a way of appealing to people in his age group you know the baby boomers because they absolutely loved music and they bought music and they had their parents buy the music so he advertised the village voice and he used a technique uh, it's as old as the hill, you know, the crazy merchant technique. It's, it goes back uh, decades and decades and decades. This is where he said, like, you know, the, you know I'm so nuts, I, I'm charging less than, than I can to, to make money. That's what I think. It's, it's hokey. And he, he figured out a way of making that make, make, making that work. And that was the whole basis of his marketing until it all came collapsing. You know, he's a marketer and he hired the right people. He hired some really smart people. And this is how we marketed his products now that was the legitimate side of crazy Eddie. it was a marketing genius you know okay wait, wait, hang uh, up. Jerry Carroll, wait, before you go Barbie. into that before you go into that so let me just set the stage uh, let me put a little context here sure. you walked into a store back in the old days uh a panasonic stereo system is marked 299 dollars. you say i want that one they wrapped it up put in a box and you pay 299 dollars plus tax Right. You walked into Crazy Eddie's store on King's Highway, and you looked at that, and he would advertise that two ninety nine, which cost him, let's say, two hundred and fifty dollars. He would advertise it for mm -hmm. one ninety nine, and you'd walk in there and say, "Wow, that is a real good buy, right?" Oh, Could, yeah. Did you walk out with it? Well, you might. Now, if uh, the two things, one of two things would happen, he'd either switch you away from that advertising product. He'd say, "Look, you know, that's that's Sony. That kind of, that's not that's no good. Here's here's a sharp. Here's a here's a low brand you never heard of. It's better." And, and he'd he'd make more money on that lower margin product. So people didn't think that was bait and switch because if you're you know they're not being switched to a higher price, product, but it's still bait and switch. It's still not not kosher. That's one way. One thing that would happen to you. The other thing that would happen to you is that, okay, you insist upon that that name brand product. He would sell it to you. And then that's when the scam started to work. That's when the Sam start, started to, 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 he would figure out a way of doing that involving collecting tax and not passing it on to the consumer, to the, to the taxing authorities. That gave him a built in profit margin. Because if you're collecting tax, you know, it was 7% in those days, it was just 7%. That's it. That's quite a profit margin. And, and, and he was able, because he collected the tax, but didn't hand it in, 
he was able to ch actually charge the advertised price. That's how he was. He was, and he was never, he was never caught. I, that was one way. The other thing that he used to do is that uh, he used to repackage. You, he used to repackage returned goods and sell it as new, which you're not supposed to do. That was the other way he would be able to beat the competition, right. selling it used goods as new. Right. So when does he come up with? And he could be just one, and it's still, you know, it's not leveraging your brand. If you're the mm -hmm. only guy in the store doing this and he had a couple of cohorts in the store, work with him at the time, or started out with him at the time, so you're only, yeah. you still need a stream of people to come in. How did all that change when he hires Jerry Carroll? Jerry Carroll was absolutely brilliant. He was a, a, a disc jockey at WPI XFM at a radio station, and he he had this 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 really unique way of selling. Uh, script, I, I don't want to imitate because you can you can see him on uh, on YouTube videos, I and mean, to this day, people you know are just marvel at this guy, whatever what a super salesman he was. As soon as he 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 is as soon as he had this this personality, you know, this TV personality. Growing up over this product, over this consumer electronics chain, uh, as soon as you had that, you know, you had this sort of almost like a, a, a the electronics chain created a star, and this star was bringing people into the store. This began around 1977, and, and his sales just took off through the roof. He he was uh, he was all over the TV. Uh, Eddie was buying advertising everywhere in in, in the Northeast. And it just caused it just caused this sort of this crazy eddy. It was called a it was called a craze. It was it was it was recognized at the time for what it was, which was a cultural phenomenon. That it was it was a it was like re way up there with uh, other cultural phenomena taking place in the, in the early seventies. Right, so I didn't. I loved it. A spoof on it. Uh, it was in the movie Splash. Yeah. I remember seeing it. And uh, in this morning, even before our, our uh, interview. Uh, for a conversation, I went on to YouTube, and I'll put the link in below, uh, for the um, for the doo-wop uh, Crazy Eddie commercial that I can't believe it was 1977 or so. I remembered all the words. I remembered all the words. It was just, it was really just a phenomenal, uh, it just kept going on. It, 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 you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, and Eddie was in the community that I live in. So he was mm -hmm. looked as a, an amazing businessman. You know, we didn't know any of mm -hmm. the stuff behind all of that, of course. And I was a young kid. In fact, I did deliver when I worked a one summer job uh, in a restaurant. I did deliver to Crazy Eddie. I delivered a lunch, not to him, but someone in the store. And I remember I made my first tip. I didn't know, like, lady gave me $10 for $8 of meal. And I said, I don't have $2 change. She goes, no, that's your tip. And that's how stupid I was. But that was my, I remember mm -hmm. walking into that store. And my mother actually worked in the warehouse uh on every mm. day. she got a job it was a few blocks from from uh, from our house and and she was a bookkeeper back in the early early days and um uh so it was really amazing at the amount of of uh of coverage that if you lived in the tri-state area back in the 70s and 80s you it's impossible for you to not have heard of crazy eddie that was your first stop anytime you bought electronics Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, he he advertised much more than all the other electronics retailers combined, and you know, over time, he became the largest uh, electronics uh, chain in the mid in the Northeast and uh, probably in the whole country. Get forty three stores. It's very unusual, you know, to have so many stores and to be raking in all that that cash. Um, and and you know, he became a national phenomenon. National phenomenon. But the thing is that you brought up, and that I remember back in the day. He was a ghost. He was not in the press. He did not want publicity. People didn't know who he was. He could have passed you in the street, and you would not have known that you were walking by Eddie Anta. Yeah, yeah. He uh, he craved anonymity. You know his uh, his uh, his his motto, which he articulated to the people around him, was in in anonymity there is security. Um, you know, he didn't want to be recognized. He wanted to have Jerry Carroll being out there as the front man. Um, turns out he was actually pretty good. You know, when he when he finally did wind up giving interviews to the press, he was he was not bad. He was good. He was articulate, and also he was very good. Um, you know, in, in when he did wind up talking to people, he wasn't bad. But he didn't want that. He wanted to stay out of the limelight. 
And that helped when he began to commit crimes because, you know, he didn't have a, uh, you know, he didn't have a public profile. Right. So from day one, he is in business uh, as a fraud because any sales tax that's coming in is never getting paid to the government. Right. So from day one, right. tell me how the cr- tell me how the crime started to multiply, and before Sam E. Antar, his cousin, who became the CFO, who became the whistleblower, uh, and now is a consultant to the FBI and many other law enforcement on how fraud is committed. Uh, man's a genius in that sense, and they go to him. It's like almost a catch me if you can, Fred Frank Abergnale. They all came to him and said, "How do?" How do we catch forgers? Uh, so um, uh, Sammy Antar be- really reformed in that sense, and and I know he teaches in university, or he appears in university, shows them how how all the books are cooked and everything. After the sales tax, you write that everything from that point on had the guise of a re- of a legitimate business, but underneath was extremely corrupt and fraudulent from day one. Walk us mm-hmm. through that. Well, um, you know, stealing stealing the sales tax, skimming skimming the uh, the profits, um, it was kind of a gateway drug, as I put it. You know, he had committed. You know, really, I mean, you're not supposed to steal sales tax. That's a felony, and he got away with it. So that was kind of a, what I call a gateway drug. He's going to do other things. Um, he used to um, commit securities fraud. I should say, I'm sorry, insurance fraud. Uh, as if it was no big deal, you know, if they had a, a leak in the in, in in the pipes or there's some water coming in through the roof, fine, he'd take advantage of it. They called it spiking the claim. They'd truck in merchandise that wasn't selling. They'd bring it into the store where there was the leak and they'd hose it down and make it part of the claim. They called that spiking the claim. They had a insurance adjuster working for them who they paid off, who helped them in this endeavor. So that was one way. They, the insurance fraud was something that they were doing all the time. And they continued to do it for years. You know, it wasn't just in the beginning. That was one thing they were doing. The other thing was warranty fraud. That was a big thing that, that Eddie was doing. Um, brought in guy, a guy who um, that was trained in warranty fraud by uh, his father, who ran some electronic stores. He brought in the guy. And, they, and you brought in a product that needed that needed um, needed service, he he put in the claim, and he put in the claim for more than it was worth, and he put in the claim even if he didn't do the work. So, so let me um, just interrupt you. So let me just walk our yeah. audience through that. So, when you bring in a claim for a Panasonic or a Sony, and you yeah. fix that, you send the the retailer sends that claim, like an insurance claim, to the company. The company right. sees that the object or uh, item was repaired and pays you for that repair. Right. So, and they didn't have very stringent ways of proving that you, in fact, had it. You just give them the model number. They trusted you. Ah, huh? big mistake. They trusted. They trusted Eddie, and they trusted all retailers. But um, you see, Eddie. See, Eddie did did warranty service. If he didn't do warranty service, I wouldn't have been wrong. But he did warranty service. So that's how it. That's how it worked out. So you bring in the claim. And he, and he made hundreds of thousands of dollars doing this. He, you, you'd bring in your unit and he, he'd he put in a fraudulent claim. Maybe he didn't even get it repaired. He put in a fraudulent claim and he did it repeatedly, ripping off the manufacturers. And only at the end did they find out what was going on. So between the warranty fraud and the skimming um, of profits, uh, which he which they were doing systematically and stealing sales tax, um, and engaging in bait and switch, um, there, there was always something going on that wasn't quite kosher, if you pardon the expression. Um, and that's the way it was forever, but that's particular. that's the way it was up until the time when things really started to heat up, when they really learned to get into the big time of fraud. And that's when Sammy Antar uh, okay. became involved. As you mentioned, Sammy Antar was the cousin of Eddie. Uh, he'd been put through school by Eddie. He was trained as an accountant. And now in order to really steal, you need an accountant. You need an accountant to help you commit securities fraud. And uh, Sammy was able to figure out a way of, of maximizing the securities fraud to really do it right. 
in the run-up to their going public, which took place in 1984. Right, but hold up to that yet. Hold up. I just want to get the, the okay. just build up this business. So it's a local business with a mm -hmm. humongous footprint in marketing, uh, much, much bigger than their stores could possibly be. Uh, nobody mm -hmm. advertises as much as them. They have, their stores are full. People, they have, I remember they used to run promotions, used to give away a color TV, used to have lines down the whole city block waiting yeah. to get into the store. And brilliant, brilliant marketing, but you just went back behind, everything was corrupt. Sales tax wasn't being paid, insurance fraud, uh, warranty fraud, bait and switch, all those things were taking place. You put it in the book here as well that Eddie surrounds himself, his organization is with very, very close people, predominantly family members, and people mm. that he knows for a long time. Just touch on that for us. Yeah, well, he he uh, you know was the uh, head of his head of his family. Uh, he became head of the um, you know this 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 family. Uh, the Antar family was formerly headed by his father, same M Antar, uh, and uh, you know it was a very tightly knit Syrian Jewish uh, family. And uh, he he uh, took over from his father uh, in the seventies after Crazy Eddie became big. Uh, his father resented it. There was a lot of friction between himself and his father, but uh, they worked together for the most part. And um, as head of the family, Eddie hired relatives. Now that 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 you know satisfied his relatives. You know he helped his relatives, but they also helped him because if you're going to commit securities fraud, you can commit crime at any level. You need to have a nucleus of loyal people, and it really helps. If you have family members and close friends, and that's what Eddie did, he surrounded himself with family members and, and, and close friends. And um, that's why his accountant, his chief financial officer, was his baby cousin, right. Sammy. Right. How old was Sammy when he takes that job? He's a, he's by 20 something. He's a young guy. Just really. He became the de facto chief financial officer when he was in his early 20s. He had graduated from. Uh, uh, Baruch College in the late 70s, 1979, I believe it was, and, and uh, he immediately went to work, and he'd always, he'd always worked at Crazy Eddie, and he, he became an accountant, uh, a CF, uh, a, 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 a certified public accountant, a CPA, went immediately to work for uh, the auditors, Crazy Eddie's auditors, who were work, working on their books, and at the same time, he was being groomed to become the chief financial officer, which he, in fact, became. And this was at a very, very early age. Right. What, what, was it, what was it that you could see that, you know, the, as the business grows and before we get into the company going public with a real fraud, and a, I said real fraud, with a fraud mm -hmm. kicks in, and I think you wrote here, uh, or, or maybe your publicist wrote this, I think it's a great line. Before Enron, before Madoff, before the Wolf of Wall Street, Eddie Antar's corruption mm. was second to none. <laughs> the difference was that it was a street franchise, a local place that was in the bloodstream of everyone's daily life in the 70s and early 80s. And Eddie pulled it off with a certain style and an in-your-face blue-collar chutzpah. <laughs> it's just absolutely, it did in plain sight. There was no hiding. It was, it was really done yeah. in front. So what, what about his personality that that enamored people to want to be close to him, uh, to want to just be in his, in his, in his sphere of influence. Well, he had a kind of, uh, he had a very magnetic personality, you know, um, he, he, to this day, uh, in one way, you, you know, that he had magnetic personality. It was almost like a cult figure yep. to a certain extent. Is that to this day, okay, six years after his death, He's still, still getting the loyalty. People still love him. The people who work for him still love the man. Um, despite everything that happened, they still love the man. And there's still a lot of loyalty to him personally among the people who know him. Even the people who were ripped off, the people who were close to him who were ripped off, with some exceptions. Basically, it's all forgive and forget. They still, you know, they still, they still love the man. They still love the man uh, even after all that had happened and to this day even though he's been dead you know they still remembered him he had this 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 sort of cult-like ability sort of a cult leader type ability magnetic 
leadership qualities to, that people wanted to do what he told them to do. He was very persuasive, very charming. And uh, it worked, and the rest was, was history. Yeah. Okay. So the business starts to grow. They go from one mm -hmm. store to uh, several stores. I remember when they went to 10 stores. I think the 10 stores was in 79 or 80. It was pretty early on then. Yeah. And uh, they have them in the Bronx. They have, oh, you tell a fascinating thing. I do remember this clearly. In 1977, when there was the, um, when, uh, the blackout in New York, and everyone is looted. Except the Crazy Eddie stores. Share with, share with the story. <laughs> yeah, it's because he hired uh, he hired off-duty police officers to be his security guards. So he uh, shipped off a bunch to, to the Bronx store, uh, which was on Fordham Road in the Bronx. I mean, that's my old neighborhood. Uh, by the late 70s. It was, it was terrible. It was pretty bad. It was terrible. And... So he had shotgun wielding guards right there in the Bronx at Fordham Road, and uh, so nobody looted the Crazy Eddie store, uh, but they looted everything else on Fordham Road. Yeah, I do remember. Uh, I knew some people who were policemen, who when I mentioned I was from the community, this is years later. They said, "Oh, mm -hmm. I used to I used to uh, work for Crazy Eddie. You used to take care of all of them and uh, all the off duty cops uh, who needed to moonlight. He paid them handsomely." And uh, they loved the position. They, they loved being his security detail. Yeah, he, um, he, he got along well with the police. Um, and, um, you know, he, he resented it some years later when, in fact, the police were called on him. But that's going ahead of our... Right, uh, right, right. Going ahead of our story. A little okay, bit. so now the business continues to expand. The money skimming continues to go on sales tax, mm -hmm. all these things, and they continue to grow. And uh, how did they come up with the idea, let's go public? Well, they always wanted to go public. You know, in the 70s, 80s, early 80s, uh, going public was starting to be a really big thing. You know, the, the market was in decline. Um, Sammy Antar, Eddie's cousin, was a uh, devotee of the stock market. And he pointed out to them that if you're going to go public, okay, if you're going to go public, um, they want to see a growing business. Okay, now you're, and his advice was, okay, you're growing, but there's a problem. You're skimming all this cash. You're skimming profits. You're skimming your profits. Now that means that you know you're 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 shooting yourself in the foot. You know you don't want to skim your profits. You know, true, you're saving on taxes. You want a lot of profits, even if it means overpaying your taxes. You, you want profits and profits and profits. So he figured out a way of manipulating the skim, all this the skim money that he was skimming off, manipulating the skim to give the appearance of profit growth, growth far beyond their actual profit growth. You know, they were growing, but, you know, when you grow – as a store, you know, sure, you're getting in more and more revenues. You may, you may not necessarily be getting more and more profits. So he fixed that. He fixed that by systematically reducing the profits. Skim. The skim of the profits year after year after year. This was between around 1979 and 1983, because they went public in 1984. And uh, they were able to produce this this prospectus, you know, they got they got a top-notch underwriter. They conned Wall Street. She said to Wall Street, "Look at the wonderful profits." But, but, we you, want, had. but you want to know something, Gary? It didn't take uh -huh. it didn't take much to con Wall Street because well, I remember <laughs> that time. Eighty three, I started as a floor trader on the floor of the New York Futures Exchange. They went public in uh -huh. eighty four. I think Oppenheimer was the uh, underwriter. Oppenheimer yeah. was the. So I do remember speaking to some friends of mine who happened to be analysts in stock firms. And uh, and these analysts were excited to buy shares because everyone knew the name or even shop yeah. there. So you had Wall Street, the people who work on Wall Street, the young people especially, who were in the business, all know the name, all have shopped in the store, all have seen the crowds, and want to get in on this. So the due diligence, uh, Sammy Antar's brilliant mastermind of fixing this and I, a diabolical uh, mastermind in doing, in doing an illegal thing. But uh, Wall Street was, I don't want to say complicit, but Wall Street kind of, you know, uh, they, they didn't do their due diligence. They, they really 
bought into the crazy Eddie story. Yeah, well, complicit would not be an overstatement. They really were complicit. You know, they they you know they were enthusiastic. Uh, they were enthusiastic because of the phony numbers. And you know, you have to. They were making like two. Their their profits were in real terms going up like two percent a year. Because it's, you know, it's, 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 it's electronics. There is not much money in electronics. Yeah, you know? there wasn't that much. And he and 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 Eddie and Sam and Eddie were able to because by reducing the amount of this mon- money that they were skimming. They were able, and they were skimming this money, mind you, in cash and sending it to Israel. They they were doing less and less skimming. They were able to turn 2% real increases to as high as 48%. Right, right. And and it's an extraordinary uh, profitability. And and I think, Gary, you start talking about the book, which I didn't know about, how Mm -hmm. they did it with the warehouse being complicit, the Crazy Eddie Warehouse and the people there, because they started looking for inventory to decrease their inventory or to report more inventory to make all these fake numbers look real. Yeah, well, that was after they went public. After they went public, they, you know, uh, well, you know, the, the, the uh, skim reduction aspect of the, of the securities fraud came to an end. You know, they, had, they went public and, you know, they got it. Once you, once you go public on the basis of fraud, you kind of have to continue fraud because real numbers is not going to look that good you gotta you gotta continue it's a little bit like madoff and you know and and his ponzi scheme you know you gotta continue so the warehouses became the center of one of his frauds because you see uh and and he got away with it one of the reasons he got away with it so easily and he was able to convince people to help him with this with his warehouse fraud is that most people don't really know that the more you have in your warehouse okay where the value of stuff in your warehouse has a direct relationship to your profitability most people don't really that doesn't occur to them but it's there's a there's a little formula that they use in computing profits that involves what's in your warehouse. So you inflate what's in your warehouse and you're gonna inflate your profits. And that's exactly what Eddie did. He started inflating his profits through inflating what's in the warehouse. Right, and the problem is, as you point out, is when you inflate and you have to continue that inflation every single quarter, you just cannot stop it. So what yeah. becomes 5%, 10% now, by year number two is 30% and you can't look back. Once you're in, you're in. Once you're in, you're in. They call it feeding the beast. You had to just feed the beast. And and it was, you know, they had a, you know, you go to his warehouse manager and say, look, Ellie, I want you to increase the amount. We have for this year, you know, in order to increase, in order to meet their profit goal, you see, that the, the Wall Street's looking for, they had to increase the number by a certain percentage. So, look, I want you to increase what the value of what's in the warehouse by X million, whatever the hell it was. And he didn't understand. And I think it's true that for most of the time, the people he was dealing with didn't really try to grasp what was going on over there. They said, all right, we'll do it. We'll do it. So they figured out ways of doing that. They just simply take notations in pencil and they'd increase, you know, what's in the ledgers. And uh, that's how they did it. They had to do other things because after a while, you know, increasing, you know, what he was doing with the warehouses was hard to sustain. You know, you can only do that. Yeah, at a certain at a certain point, you know, it, it's it, it starts to run out of steam. So he figured out other ways of increasing your profits, and he was very good at it. You know, for as far as he went, he really knew how to how to do that. Okay, now the the person, the whistleblower, who eventually uh, works with the government and provides incredible detail behind the scenes, uh, lets the government build the case because they still were in the dock as to how this was getting done. Yeah. Right? Was Sam E. Antar. Yeah, Sam E. Antar was his cousin. And Sam E., uh, you know, he came up with the initial scheme to reduce the scam, and he uh, he was assisted with the, with the you know, actually it was, it was Eddie who came up with the original warehouse inflation scheme. Uh, but uh, they worked together to, to inflate the profit. So it was one of the things that he did um, that they worked together to do. They had something called debit memos. That's where you send a, a memo. It's like an invoice to the supplier. You say, yeah, you owe me money because of a discount. And well, you owe me you, you owe me some money on this. The moment you write one of those those debit memos, whether it's legitimate or not, whether they ignore it or not, makes no difference. As soon as you write one of those debit memos, it immediately becomes profit. You know, so it's almost as if they were writing their own ticket. They were by just writing out debit memos. They were increasing. They were increasing their profits. You know, and that's because 
the rules of accounting are set up for basically legitimate people. They're not set up for liars. They're not set up for criminals. Set, so therefore, the rules of accounting allow debit memos be to, you know, to become you know profit little profit machines. Right. So uh, they go public in 1984 mm -hmm. uh, at $8 a share. Right. And the stock starts to fly. Mm. Right, how, how it goes to what sixty something or? Yeah, it goes up to over seventy dollars a share. You know, they split the the stock. You know, splitting the stock is something you do when you're when the stock's zooming and you know you want to reduce the share price. It means you give a you, you cut the price of the stock in half and, and you give people more uh, the, the same amount of shares. You double the yeah. number of shares. You know? So he was splitting the shares, and and he was oh the stock was going up. Now the reason. Uh, you know, uh, apart from the fact that he had to continue this fraud, you know, or else he was going to be caught and, you know, he had to feed the bees. In addition to just survival, he was the biggest, Eddie and his father, members of the family, Eddie was the biggest shareholder. So, and he wasn't going to hold on to this garbage stock. He knew it was garbage. He knew it was sustained by fraud. He started selling and selling and selling, um, dumping shares because he didn't want to hold on to the stock. Now, dumping shares to such an extent that it started to make people suspicious. You know, why are you dumping shares? You know, it doesn't look good when the CEO of a company starts to dump shares. Right. So he used to put out an excuse. He said, well, look, I have the right to diversify my portfolio. I'm diversifying my portfolio. And people believed him. He diversifying his portfolio by selling 20% of his home. That's, you're diver that, that's diversifying. It was ridiculous. And yet everybody, believed, even, the, even the newspapers, you know, his intelligent financial journalists quoted Eddie's uh, diversifying baloney uh, in articles about CEOs diversifying their portfolio. It was, it was really something, you know, just uh, – the way he was able to con people because the analysts and the financial press all believed that, you know, CEOs are basically honest people. They, they did not, it, this was before Madoff. This is before, this is before Eddie, you know, this is before Eddie was, was captured. And it, it was, it was believed that, you know, CEOs weren't just going to lie or be criminals. Basically honest. That's why it was believed. Describe to us what the Panama pump was and how it's still studied today in business school. See, it all had to do with the skim. The skim uh, had been reduced in order to provide uh, paper profits, fake profits, as you know, in the run up to the IPO. So they reduced the skim, but nevertheless, Eddie and his father, members of his family, still they had a lot of money in cash in Israel, in, in bank accounts in Israel. They had, they had they had money there that they had skimmed over the years from from you know, Crazy Eddie when it was a private company. So they still had a lot of money there. And um, came the time late in our saga when Crazy Eddie needed to increase sales in its stores. You see. Uh, the store sales were lagging, you know, uh, when you, when analysts, you see, it's all about Wall Street analysts. Wall Street analysts like to look for increased sales in stores that have been around for a while. They want to be sure that the sales are increasing because the sales, because people are going into the stores, not because you're opening up more stores. So they wanted to see more sales in places like Fordham Road in the Bronx, which had been around forever, even though it was a, uh, the neighborhood was fast declining. You know, they wanted to see sales in the older stores really increase. So Sammy came up with the idea and said, look, we got all this cash in Israel. Let's bring it into the United States. Let's, let's put those, 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 uh, that, all that cash into the store's cash registers to make it seem as if people are actually going into the stores and mine. So that's where the Panama pump originated. Which, which, so let, me, let me just, let me just uh, stop you there, sure. uh, which would then make the numbers look even better, which would then satisfy yeah. Wall Street analysts, which would then make the stock price rise, which would then let Eddie sell more shares at a higher price. Exactly, exactly, exactly. In order to do this, you needed to have money go into the cash registers. So that's where the Panama pump originated. It, it was just, uh, you know, instead of taking money out of 
out of the uh, you know the stores like they used to they simply brought money in from israel and they brought it in through panama you see the idea of doing that was well you know if you do it through panama you know it comes from israel this is directly from israel let's bring it in through panama because they've got bank secrecy laws you know uh, eddie was under the impression i think also uh generally uh, eddie and his his, his uh, cohorts were under the impression that it was just like in the james bond movies you know that that bank secrecy laws really meant something you know and they didn't really mean very much by then you know the u.s government was cracking bank secrets oh, yeah, okay we're going to bring in these this this money through panama panama mind you and that because of their bank secrecy laws they'll never get wind of it so they they brought the money to a bank Leumi branch in Panama, and then the, they were transferred into bank drafts. And they were physically carried from Panama up to the up to the United States. The, um, the bank drafts were deposited in the individual store accounts, you see. Uh, each store had its own corporate structure, which is something that you see in, in chain stores, you know, if sometimes every store will be its own little independent company. So they would put the money, they put these bank drafts from Panama into the individual store accounts and voila, it worked. It had to work. They were putting money in the, in the cash registers. And it, it gave the impression that um, the top store sales were doing well, the stores were doing well. This was at a time, you see, when Eddie was starting to get competition, you see. His discount model was starting to be imitated, you know. People were seeing this wildly successful, you know, uh, discount store model. I said, wow, you, we, we, we can beat Eddie at his own game. So, right. you know, he was getting com- competitors really cutting into his uh, into his profits, you know, in the in the um, uh, 86, 87. Mm-hmm. He was getting he was getting hammered. And when do the wheels fall off and the government steps in? Well, after a time, you see, because even with all this fraud, even with all this fraud, um, it, it's it, the, the, he couldn't really sustain the profitability the way he wanted to. So profit started to decline. He just, you know, there was only so much you can do. You know, you can only do so much fraud without making it look really ridiculous. You know, you can only inflate the warehouses so much. You can only, you know, pump in so much cash from Panama. So profits started to decline. And when profits started to decline, you see, there was a sharp decline in profits, mind you. This was around 1980, uh, what, 1986, early 1987. There was a sharp decline in profits, sharp decline in the stock price. Now, you see, when the stock price declined, one of the disadvantages of going public came to the fore. You see, they were focusing on the advantages of going public when they went when, when they when they went public with their you know with their you know Animal all Kong. their machinations and all their all their schemes. It didn't occur to them, or if it did occur to them, they didn't really focus on it. That once you go public, once you're selling stock to the public, anybody can buy up your stock. And they can buy up the stock and get in control of the company, kick you out. And once they kick you out, they gain access to your books and your books are just, uh, well, before you know it, you're going to go to jail. And that is precisely what happened. They attracted the interest of two of the unluckiest (laughs) takeover artists in the history of takeovers. There was this fellow, Victor Palmieri. He was a very intelligent man. He'd done a lot. He got brilliant press. Uh, You know, this is a guy who was, who've been around for many years he took over a lot of suffering companies and really you know, he, he was he was just one of the princes of wall street victor palmieri and then there was this fellow elias zinn who was a texas retailer a real uh you know again the press love these guys you know they were colorful characters elias zinn was this guy from you know he was this college drop he wasn't a high school drop he was i believe i believe he was a college drop he he built up this big chain of electronic stores in Texas and Elias Zinn and Victor Palmieri combined forces to take over Crazy Eddie because they were under the impression because they believed what they read in the financial statements. They believed that this was a company that used to be really profitable, okay, and could be restored to profitability because they were smarter than the Antars. So they, they launched a takeover uh, bid and they got what they wanted. You know, it's like the old saying, be careful what you wish for, because you may get it. 
and they got it. And it's actually this funny scene in the book. Uh, Antar met Eddie Antar met with Palmieri, and Palmieri said, "I want, I want this company." I want my company. And, and, and Eddie said to him, Mr. Palmieri, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. Right. <laughs> yeah, it was true. And, and, and they met Milton. Yeah. They met, uh, I think, earlier on uh, Milton Petrie also. In the, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Of, of amazing fame. And he was just outclassed them. He probably knew what was going or got a wind of what was going on and backed off. Well, Petrie was a real, you know, he was, he was a genuinely, unlike some of the other people in the book, Petrie was one of the few people who was genuinely, a genuinely good person, you know, just, you know, and, and uh, Sam Antar, you know, was a cynical, hardened guy, but, you know, Sammy Antar, that's to say the, the cousin, the, he, 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 you know, this guy's a philanthropist, he gives money to, 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 to ordinary people down on their luck, you know, do we really want to cheat milk Petri anymore? God, we don't want to do it. But they also felt, look, Petri's such a smart guy. He, he's going to find out what's going on. They can hoodwink Milton Petri. So he met with this guy on the Upper East Side, and he served them a nice kosher meal. And, and, and you know, they they talked, and uh, he was he expressed interest in in buying the company. And they sort of politely said, "No, we yeah. we don't want it." But the fact that a Milton Petri, the fact that a Petri guy like him would consider buying this company. Uh, showed the kind of you know how the extent to which they really were were hoodwinking people about the company. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's speed up ahead. The wheels fall off the mm -hmm. cart. Zinn and Palmieri buy the company. They're missing tens of millions of dollars that never existed. Eddie flees mm -hmm. the country, goes into hiding. Eventually gets caught, brought back to the United States, and at that time, Sam, the accountant, his cousin becomes a whistleblower. And I love how you put in the book that originally when Sam volunteers all his knowledge to tell them exactly how things went out, they push him back. They don't, they don't want to know. That's right. They, they, they talk to us about that. And by the way, Sam, I just want to point out that Sam Antar was the uh, person you got most of the information, am I right, on this, on this book? Uh, well, a lot uh, of the information, yeah. you know, I would say the majority of the, of, of the book, I'd say a good 70% of it is as out of public documents, yeah. which is to say stuff, you know, like the trial transcript, right. um, you know, depositions, and, uh, but of, well, certainly of all the people I interviewed, Sam was, was by far the most, uh, the most cooperative and the most helpful. There's just no question about it. Sammy and her. Um, but um, yeah, Sammy Antar, you know, um, one of one of Eddie's mistakes as uh, the fraud crumbled was that he started to neglect his co-conspirators. Now that's a big mistake. You don't neglect your co-conspirators because they can rot. Yeah, it didn't occur to him apparently that you know if you treat your your principal co-conspirator badly, he might become a witness against you. You know, Eddie had this blind spot in that regard. So. You know, Sammy was in was in serious trouble. He, he needed money to pay his lawyer bills. His lawyer bills said that he was racking up to defend the family, to defend Eddie. But despite that, Eddie wouldn't give him a nickel. He loaned them money. He had him sign a promissory note for crying out loud. To, 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 he wouldn't give him a penny to, to, for his legal bills. So as Sammy decided, look, I got I got to go. Uh, I got I got to turn state's evidence. I got to protect myself. I got to protect my father, who was in the business too. So he goes to the feds. We're in Newark. The Newark office of the, um, of the U.S. attorney was handling it. So he, went to, he went to the prosecutor and he spilled his guts, hired a great lawyer, spilled his guts, spent three hours there. And the prosecutor has been, I, I don't believe you. <laughs> and uh, you're, you're, what are you, this is a lot of baloney. What, man, I'm a pump. Come off it. I don't believe you. I've got two witnesses. They are the best witnesses. They were inside. Crazy Eddie and darn, they know what's going on. I don't need you. You're going to have to go. If you want to plead guilty, go ahead and plead guilty. I don't care. You're going to have to go to prison for five years. So, that, so you know, he practically committed suicide. I mean, I mean I'm i telling you, he said, look, I'm the CEO of the company. I know everything that's going on. And he doesn't believe me. So, uh, that's, uh, that's, how, that's how he was greeted when he went to, when he went to the feds. Um, and so, his lawyer advised him, said, look, Sam, uh, you know, you don't, you're sort of in a bad shape here. The chief prosecutor doesn't, doesn't, 
the prosecutor handling the case doesn't doesn't believe you. So what you're going to have to do is as an FBI man here, who I trust, and you should trust him. You should go to this FBI man. His name is Paul Hayes. Go to this FBI man. Tell him everything you know. Now you're not going to have any anything you say will be held against you. But you should do it anyway because if you go to this guy. You're putting your, yourself at his mercy, but I think you can trust him. It was a really risky play, but that's exactly what he did. And he just told everything he knew to this FBI man, Paul Hayes. And what happens at the end? Is Eddie caught? Eddie is caught, and he goes to trial. Now, these two wonderful witnesses that this federal prosecutor just absolutely adored, they turned out to be a couple of... Uh, couple of bozos. One of them actually uh, even committed perjury in the course of giving his testimony, and uh, they were completely useless. Sam became the principal witness. He testified against Eddie, and Eddie went to prison. And that did not end the story, because like, in the, you know, I've noticed in, in, when I was reporting the story, you know, nothing ever seemed to go in a linear fashion, you know. There was always something weird that happened right afterwards. So he they got a conviction. They had this judge who couldn't stand the sight of Eddie and threw the book at him, threw the book at his brother, uh, who was also um, uh, uh, who, who was a one, one also in the code of fans who was convicted, and it was overturned. It was overturned on on ridiculous grounds. You know, the, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals mis misinterpreted something the judge said during the sentencing. And they threw it out. They threw out this this two week trial and everything. They had to go had to start all over again. However, uh, Eddie and his brother Mitchell, uh, who both were convicted, uh, he haven't mentioned his brother Mitchell. His brother Mitchell was also convicted of security fraud. They both cut plea deals, and Eddie went to prison, and he served a total of uh, total of seven years in prison, including the time that he spent in Israel. Um fighting extradition, which uh, was one of the more peculiar aspects of the book because uh, uh, he believed, he actually believed that Israel was going to give him refuge, even though he not only, he had become a citizen of Israel, okay, because he thought, yeah, I'm, I'm a citizen of Israel, they're going to give me refuge, but he also gave the citizen, he also became a citizen under an alias, he, he created a phony citizenship despite doing that, despite making a mockery of the law of return in this fashion. He thought, you know, the Israelis are going to protect me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, can you imagine? He created, a, he created a phony persona and made this guy a citizen of Israel, and he, and he didn't think that there were going to be any repercussions. Israel was happy to get rid of the guy. So, anyway. And how, how does the story end? Finally goes to prison. Yeah, and he goes to prison, seven right, seven years and then? Years. And he gets out, 1999, and the whole world has changed, certainly in the electronics business. You know, he, um, yeah, he, he, he just, uh, you know, he, he, he lives, uh, you know, there's efforts made to revive um, the um, Crazy 80 brand, but they didn't succeed. Uh, and, um, he just, uh, you know, he died, uh, uh, you know, just a few years ago. Um, they, they, you know, they sort of the reputation lived on. Um, his reputation um, outlived Eddie, you might say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and uh, lastly, and we'll put, we'll we'll end uh, on this. What happens to Sam Antar? Does he serve any prison time? Sam, uh, there are two Sams involved. Of course, there's Sam the, the father Sam, Sam the and the accountant Sam. The father Sam, who was neck deep in the scam, he didn't serve any time in prison. He was he was very lucky. Didn't serve any time in prison. Now, Sam E, the uh, whistleblower, the uh, informant, Sam E did not, uh, he pleaded guilty to two felony counts. And he was lucky. He got a judge, Judge a Judge uh, Politan, uh, who was a great believer in informants. Not every judge would do this. He gave him um, 
a, a sentence that was he had to serve time in, in at home, home confinement. That was that was the worst he got. Just just home confinement. No home confinement is no is no picnic. You don't want to get locked up in your home for whatever it was a year or two. But he didn't spend any time in prison. Amazing. And how come uh, here that uh, why is the crazy Eddie fraud scheme still taught in every business school across the United States? Well, I'd say it's because uh, it covered the waterfront of fraud. You know, he, um, he committed securities fraud. You know, uh, he sort of committed securities fraud. With, with, you know, in 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 several ways. You know, and you know, made off. You know, he committed only one kind of fraud. You know, it was pyramid scheme. Well, Eddie, Eddie committed securities fraud in several ways. So he could teach. You know, if you study the crazy Eddie fraud, you could study how to commit securities fraud in several very interesting ways, which you know, each individually can be utilized to to to, to commit. And he also committed other kinds of fraud, warranty fraud. He committed uh, tax fraud. So you study Eddie, and you you really learn from a master. You know, he's no longer alive, but you study how this master criminal carried out fraud. Uh, and and uh, it can be very educational to people on both sides, I'd say on both sides of the law. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely amazing. Gary, fantastic. Folks, the name of the book is Retail Gangster, The Insane Real Life Story of Crazy Eddie by Gary Weiss. Uh, highly suggest you go out and get a copy of it. Extremely entertaining, but more so insightful into the mind of someone who uh, creates an amazing fraud and perpetuates it right on Wall Street for years, for years, until the wheels fall off, which sometimes takes a little longer than others, but usually does. <laughs> Right? Frauds uh, collapse under their own weight. Yeah. And that's it. Gary, thank you so much for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Oh, I really, uh, really appreciate you having me. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on the Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.